All right, I have 9 a.m. So we will get started as we like to start these echoes on time. I'm uh, happy to see everyone. Looks like we have a smaller group today and that might be just okay or people are just slow on in tuning in. So um, happy to have you here today. It is, uh, it's not July, it's August 11th. Good grief, where did July go? Um, and we're already in the second week of August. So time keeps marching on and uh, we are all still hopefully all safe from um, COVID and continuing our work to help people um, as they travel through all of their health issues besides COVID, right? Good morning, I'm Janine Gracie. I am the project director for the HTRC, the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center, and I have the opportunity to moderate these sessions. Um, this is a joint partnership with the Missouri Telehealth Network, um, and we are offering this echo for providers in Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma, and we'll address topics at ad nauseum to your pleasure. We have had a lot of topics on uh, billing, we do regulations, we do the technical aspects, operations, clinical, that type of thing. So um, we're glad that you're joining us. And uh, it seems like we haven't ha run out of things to talk about during um, this COVID um, when it relates to telemedicine. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone on this ECHO to make sure that you name your ECHO screen. So what you do is you right click on your picture or your name and um, then it comes up with a little menu and you can rename. Uh, so what we want you to do is put your first and last name and the state abbreviation so that when you're asking questions, we know what state you're from and we can answer those appropriately. So right click on your picture and click rename. Now we will have our team members introduce themselves. Um, and today we will start with Evelyn. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. I'm Evelyn Nelson. I'm a telepsychologist at University of Kansas Medical Center and the PI for the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. Thank you, Evelyn. I don't think we have uh, Rachel. Rachel's at a wedding. Her niece is getting married. Um, and so she's not with us today. And I don't see um, Karen. Uh, so we'll go with Tim. I guess uh, I'll do, okay. Uh, Good morning, uh, I'm Tim Davis, Telehealth Manager at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences and the HTRC representative for Oklahoma. Thank you, Tim. And you are never, never last but not least, I'll tell you that. Um, we have Heather on the hub as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heather Hagen. I'm a telehealth analyst at OSU CHS. Thank you, Heather. And I don't see Robert today. So if he jumps on, then we'll have him introduce himself. Might be some vacations going on this week, right? Everybody needs a little time away from the Zoom meetings and the computer and that type of thing. So um, I understand that. Now, since we have a smaller group today, let's go ahead and have um, uh, everyone introduce themselves. So we're gonna ask you to unmute your mic and um, and give us your name and your organization and state that you're from. So we'll start, um, I'm gonna have Lauren uh, introduce herself. She's an important member of this team as well. So Lauren, would you introduce yourself, please? Everyone, my name is Lauren Dom. I'm currently the telehealth coordinator for this ECHO. Um, and I also have CC Vangel with me. She's gonna be taking over the coordinator role here shortly. So I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you, Lauren. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm CC Vangel and I am in training with Lauren. Glad to be with you. Glad to have you, CC. Thank Sydney. you. Sydney, would you introduce yourself? Oh, I think you're on mute. I don't know if you can. 
My name is Sydney Daniels. I'm with Southeast Missouri Health Network in Benton, Missouri. Great, thank you. All right, um, Shandrika Ford. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shandrika Ford. I'm a community health worker with the Kansas City Care Clinic. Thank you, good to have you. All right, Allison. Good morning, I'm Allison Troutwine. I'm a project manager at Truman Medical Centers in Kansas City, Missouri. Good deal, thank you for joining us. Uh, Dean. Good morning, I'm Dean Anderson, one of the outreach coordinators for the Show Me Echo program. So if you have ideas on how to bring more folks into our echoes, hit me up, thanks. Thanks, Dean, that's great. Angie. Hi, I'm Angie Johnson with GL and Associates in Jefferson City, Missouri. Nice to have you, Angie. Great. Jerry? I'm Jerry Wilmus, Executive and Medical Director for Northwest Missouri State and also with uh, Missouri Life Care or Mosaic Life Care. I'm sorry, that's a Northwest Missouri based healthcare system. Good to have you, Jerry. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Jill? Good morning. I'm Jill Sigliano with Memory Care Home Solutions in St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you, Jill. And uh, Myla? Myla Cunningham, Columbia, Missouri, a physician. Very good. Thank you, Myla. And Callie? I'm Callie Ballinger. I'm nurse residency coordinator for the Mid-America Division with HCA Hospitals and a PRN nurse practitioner with the University on the Go Clinics. Very good. Thank you. Shelly. Hi. I, I thought you said Shelly, so I'm going to jump in. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Shelly Cooper, and I'm CEO of Diversity Telehealth here in Kansas City. I do a lot of work with um, asthma-rated communities there in Columbia. Wonderful. Thank you, Shelly. Beth? Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Munson. I work with Lauren and Cece and Dean at Missouri Telehealth, and I wanted to join the Echo today to see how fabulous telehealth is. <laughs> Good deal. Thank you, Beth. Well, I hope we can satisfy that need. All right, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deborah. I'm a community health worker with the Kansas City Care in Kansas City, Missouri, and I work primarily with children who have Medicaid through Children's Mercy Hospital. Very good. Thank you. Ann? Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Simon. I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Mercy Hospital St. Louis, and I'm in the Mercy Kids Autism Center. Wonderful. Thank you. Rebecca? Good morning, I'm Rebecca Chichima. I'm a data coordinator with the Missouri Telehealth Network. Thank you. Tammy? Hello, I'm accidentally logged in as Tammy, but I'm Christina King. Um, I'm the IT staff here at Boo Hill Counseling Services in Saxton, Missouri. Excellent, very good, thank you. All right. Um, all right, the, the Brady Bench squares jumped around on me. So I'm Jackie. Good morning, this is Jackie Young with the uh, Department of Health and Senior Services Wise Woman Program. Very good, thank you, Jackie. And Blake. My name is Blake Weston. I'm with KC Care Health Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and also St. Luke's on the plaza. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, now did I miss anybody because of the uh, changes in the, <laughs> I tried to go you know, down the row and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So if you did not introduce yourself, you have a couple of seconds to jump on here. We good? Hey. My name is Heidi Miller. I'm a primary care doctor in St. Louis, Missouri. Heidi snuck in on me. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Well, we do that so that we can start to um, get to know one another and feel more comfortable. Uh, 
reaching out and connecting because that's what this echo is all about is that connection in order for us to be able to um, work with one another and answer questions and and bring up um, ideas um, so don't don't be shy at all during these echoes to uh, let us know what you're thinking all right so now we're going to go through just a few announcements um, just for a more collegial environment, we do just use first names on our echo. So that's, uh, um, that is an important part of an echo. Um, please make sure that you do not share any confidential protected health information. If you do ask a question about a particular patient or something that is going on. Usually we have Joe Kingsbury on with us and we have you ask questions to Joe Kingsbury, but today, um, he is out as well, and so we are going to ask that you ask questions through the chat, and Lauren will monitor that, but just to ask, just go ahead and ask the question to everyone, and we'll uh, make sure that we get those questions asked, and then also you're free to unmute your mic and ask that question out loud as well, so don't be shy. Um, if you have questions, we want you to certainly um, ask those and get those answered. Uh, please keep your microphone on mute until you're ready to speak and, uh, you know, remind us and say your name before you speak. Um, this presentation will be available on Box, and so if you're on there, great. If not, um, there are instructions um, on how to get on Box, and if you have trouble with that, Lauren uh, can certainly help you with that. Um, the value of ECHO is in the case study. So if you ever have a case study that you want to submit, um, please volunteer to do that because it really does make the ECHO more interesting. And there's my daily spam call from South Carolina. Um, <laughs> and our team will uh, put any case recommendations on inbox for anyone to see um, if we do have a case. So, that does it for the announcements. And now um, our speaker is me. So I will pull my uh, slides up here so that we can get started. And we're gonna talk a little bit because we had a request to talk about five essential steps for building telehealth during COVID. And so I wanna make sure that um, we get those questions answered and we'll start with this. All right. So, um, you may have heard some of this before from other speakers, maybe from me in June, but um, it's worth going over again. I do wanna remind you that the reason this ECHO exists is through um, a grant that supports the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. And the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center is one of um, 12 other um, telehealth resource centers across the nation and we're supported by HRSA. And so we wanna remind you that no, no matter where you or any of your colleagues are, there is a telehealth resource center within reach. And we assist um, your organizations through a variety of things such as webinars such as these and workshops trainings that type of thing so please do not hesitate to reach out if you need additional information on telemedicine so covid uh, and telemedicine that's kind of what set uh, uh, medicine on its ear and brought telemedicine uh, to light uh, definitely we we certainly uh, progressed telemedicine in a couple of months uh, with a decade of work. I, seriously, it is so um, prevalent now that people um, are liking it and they think that it's a, a great way to see um, patients and also a great way to see their healthcare providers. So it is um, definitely a two-way street when it comes to telemedicine these days. I want to remind you of uh, these resources for COVID-19 and telemedicine. These uh, 
websites are something that you can look at and really get a lot of information from if you're needing documents, if you're needing um, information about um, regulations and that type of thing. So we will talk about these websites as we go along, but I wanna make sure that you have these at your disposal. We're always in for a little humor. So uh, notice she's holding the tin can, you know, like we used to play with when we were kids. And this is what telemedicine looks like for a small practice like ours. And you know, it, it makes you kind of giggle, but at the same time, it's some of it is reality, unfortunately. We don't have great broadband everywhere in our states. And uh, so something like this is not too far-fetched, really. So if you're looking at making uh, those steps to develop a telemedicine program because you have not, or if you're looking at these steps as a way to go back and maybe shore up your telemedicine program that was started so quickly during COVID, um, this, you know, these are the steps that I would recommend that you go through. There are certainly uh, different um, steps in terms of if you have a lot of time to plan, but this will help you get going uh, pretty fairly quickly. Um, so the first one is bring a team together. Really do not try to start your telemedicine program alone in your office all by yourself because that's not gonna work. Um, it really is a team effort and it takes everybody um, in your organization to bring in those best ideas about how to go about doing that. Because I've always said, if you've seen one telemedicine program, you've seen one telemedicine program, okay? They're, they're all different uh, pending on the organization that is implementing them. So what you do when you get together is you make sure that <clears throat> you are deciding what you're trying to achieve. Um, you're going to need to do a quick organizational readiness assessment, seeing what equipment you already have, seeing what uh, lines of service perhaps you're already providing through telemedicine, because sometimes um, we just want to expand our telehealth program instead of start one from scratch, okay? So it, it's perfectly fine. These steps will help you go through both of those. Um, you really do have to get buy-in from um, perhaps um, um, administration. Uh, you might have to get buy-in from clinical directors. You might have to get buy-in from those informal leaders in the organization that sometimes make or break a program, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's really important to get together, decide what you're trying to achieve, and then um, establish some of these um, questions that we have going on. So some of the readiness questions that you can ask are, do we have the resources available to begin? Definitely. Um, and of course, you're going to want to ask about payment and policy for the certain lines of service that you're thinking about. Uh, now with COVID, you know, that has been um, expanded. And so it's a little bit easier, if you will, uh, than it was before when it really was so, so specific to what Medicare or Medicaid or private payers were going to be able to um, ins insure and get you get reimbursed. Now it's a little bit better and we're seeing patients from, oh my gosh, home, which has opened up um, a lot of buckets of reimbursement. And, um, and also the fact that people want to see their provider by telemedicine just to stay safe so that they are not sitting in a waiting room with someone who may have COVID. Um, you need to look for that champion in your organization, someone who's excited about telemedicine and someone who really wants this to work. Um, those types of people um, are really necessary to get this uh, off the ground and going. Look at your equipment. What do you already have? A lot of us already have the equipment that we need in order to make a really nice telemedicine program. Look at your staff, who is going to do what, um, are there people that are willing to add a little bit something to their job description in order to make this telemedicine uh, project work? And then look to leadership and make sure that they're on board and that they have uh, perhaps some resources that you uh, are available so that you can begin your program. 
the strategic planning cycle is always something really handy to have. Um, a lot of times we think that strategic planning takes too much time and that type of thing, but it really is good to go through these steps quickly in order to make your telemedicine program something that will last instead of something that will just go away. The people to keep in your circle, of course, we talked a little bit about um, healthcare providers need to be at the table. Um, clinical directors, billing office, do not forget your billing office because that is when things can go south quickly. Schedulers, they're your front line. You've got to have a scheduler in there that's going to be able to be the voice and, and know um, how to help other schedulers in terms of maybe a, um, oh, what, what they say when they first answer the phone. And if they say, okay, we have a telemedicine opening, would you like to have one of those instead of, you know, making, giving it a negative light? Um, have IT, of course, involved. And if you are lucky enough to have marketing, have those folks at the table as well. So step two, these, this is where you assess those lines of, I say lines, maybe it's just a line of service to be delivered. I really recommend that everyone start small and then grow, okay? If you start with one line of service and perfect it, it's gonna be so much easier to add other lines of service instead of trying to do it all at once and being everything to everyone. So if, if you're hesitant, you don't have a lot of extra FTE to help and put on this telemedicine project, do one line of service and do it well, and then move on to the next. Uh, make sure that you're researching the reimbursement and the regulations, and if you need help with that, certainly let your HTRC know, and keep excellent notes. I can't tell you how important it is to do that because you wanna be able to go back historically and say, okay, this is how we did this, and it worked, or it didn't, so let's try something different, okay? And also the fact that um, there may be funds available that you might want to um, write a grant. And so use those notes um, to help with the historical, how you got started and that type of thing. So assessing the lines of service is just as simple as asking these questions. So what appointments are appropriate for telehealth in the home? Um, televideo or telephonic? Because now we're getting reimbursed for some telephonic appointments. And what appointments are appropriate in an originating site? So a site where a patient would go to to see a specialist and that specialist requires certain peripherals uh, to be used during that appointment. So, you know, that's, that's another step uh, in your telemedicine plan. And then, you know, it's not a bad idea to say, okay, what appointments must occur in person? Uh, because we can't do everything by telemedicine and we've never thought that we could. Um, it's just that there are some lines of service that are appropriate for telemedicine, such as um, some clinical use cases on this slide. If you look through those, you can see that there's a variety of um, use cases that can benefit, uh, patients can benefit from telehealth. And a lot of times it's just those patients that have those uh, complex health problems that have treatment plans that need to be adjusted frequently. And they can be managed by telemedicine. Um, and video-based um, appointments can involve medication adjustments, managing side effects, lab results, and again, that treatment plan management. Also, wellness exams and follow-ups are excellent for telemedicine, if that's what you would like to do, and visits can focus on lifestyle changes and, and the results of some of the lab or, you know, mammography, colonoscopy, that type of thing, because, you know, instead of having to go in and get some of those results, then you could just do that by telemedicine and reduce, um, you know, the waiting time in, in the waiting room as well as um, the exposure to other diseases. Here's a really nice slide that shows you what an annual wellness visit could look like via telemedicine. Um, a wellness um, visit 
is a lot about the provider listening, okay? Um, and then also obtaining information from a health risk assessment, maybe a patient history has changed and, that, and you need to know that. Um, there are several screenings that you can do via telemedicine. And, um, and then there are things that, you know, we have to send out to lab and that type of thing. And then you can do a follow-up with those lab results. Now, reimbursement. So it's important to, you know, create lines of service that you're going to get reimbursed for. All right. So in, during COVID, that's been easier. What we want to look, we always need to plan past the crisis. So we need to look at um, reimbursement um, with two eyes, okay, instead of one. Um, we need to look at Medicare, see what those fee for services are, keep up with um, your HTRC and maybe even uh, sign up for our newsletter so that you can see and hear um, what's going on in DC when it comes to Medicare. I know a lot of these um, fee for service they're trying to uh, make permanent. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I wish I had a crystal ball. I don't. Um, but it looks promising in some aspects that they're going to continue some of these reimbursements. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to pull it back. I think one of the CMS directors said the genie's out of the bottle and you can't put it in back in. So telemedicine is here. It's here to stay. Medication, uh, Medicaid, some of those rules differ by each of our states. And so on our website, which I uh, gave you, we have some uh, information about the differences in state Medicaid. And then private commercial insurance, they vary by state too. Now, I'm happy to say that every one of our states has a parity law, but parity laws differ by, is it coverage parity? Is it reimbursement parity? That type of thing. So it's important to um, make sure that you understand what private and commercial payers can and can't do in the state. All right, then you look at your technology needs. All right, after you get reimbursement, you've done your assessment, now you're looking at technology. Um, you need a detailed technology plan, whether you're doing this quickly or not. And so you need to know what equipment we have, what's gonna work, where are we gonna put this equipment? And then also thinking about um, after the um, equipment and the appointments have occurred, that you are monitoring your telemedicine program. So you're gonna to have to monitor benchmarks, which, um, you know, like what may be, what are your return on investments for uh, telemedicine during this project? And then also, um, are we providing patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction? Here are some, a list, uh, and so you're gonna wanna go on box to get this slide, but these are free or low cost telehealth platforms right now during COVID that they said that they would work with organizations so that they could provide these uh, platforms, telehealth platforms. And so uh, some of them are free or some of them have just reduced their cost. Um, some of them are giving you a 60 day trial. I can't recommend one platform over the other. Um, there are others that aren't even on this list, but these are the ones that we know of that have the free or low cost telehealth platforms. Um, we are vendor agnostic at the telehealth resource center. So we have to ask you to do some of that research that will work for your organization because, you know, something that works for our organization may not work for your organization. So make sure that you uh, take a look at this. This is a nice, um, a nice list of people who are willing to help get you into uh, telemedicine. Um, some of these trends that we're seeing with video platforms are that they are web-based. You don't have to have a huge server to um, store all that information. And also the fact is you, should not ever record a telemedicine session. So there should be no reason for you to record a session and keep it on uh, a server. Um, the, also, the other trends are definitely that um, it's not just for remote patient monitoring in the home, but now we have visits in the home that um, these web-based uh, trends really are you know, good for that in-home uh, appointment. 
the mobile platforms, um, and then the link-based ones where you just click on a link um, and you don't have to download an app or anything to see your physician. You can just click on the link or the physician just clicks on a link to see the patient. So make sure that you look and, and um, do a test. This is where IT comes in handy. They want to uh, look at the sufficient bandwidth, uh, both downlink and uplink. And it's important that um, they work with your internet provider because a lot of times they can put boosters in uh, organizations. This is where sometimes it's not just the fact that the internet is um, uh, available, but your building may be a barrier because there, sometimes if you're trying to use broadband and you're trying to use um, the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and that type of thing, that it, the building is sometimes a problem with concrete and uh, lots of steel and that type of thing. So you can walk around and find your hot spots in your organization as well in your building. Um, so your IT would know how to do that but this is what they recommend that you have and this is for those types of these types of tele video visits such as zoom what we're doing today um and so they recommend a megabits per second so at least you know you can say you can talk to your it like you really know what you're talking about okay so megabits per second and this is what you need in order to have a really good uh bandwidth in order to hold a televideo visit without it being interrupted. Really, it's important to hardwire that um, into the, the wall or into the uh, modem, okay, because the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth uh, sometimes creates difficulties with the speed, with the image, and the quality of the picture. Um, so it's uh, sometimes important for you to do that. So it may be a stationary uh, place that you have to have your telemedicine if you have um, low bandwidth. And there's really no need to uh, uh, purchase expensive equipment. You don't need a robot, okay, to do telemedicine. You can take inventory and stay in your budget with uh, fashioning a tablet on uh, an IV pole and create your own cart, okay? Um, we did this with an ALS clinic in, in Wichita, Kansas, where uh, we call him Virtual Dr. Barron. He was now in Missouri. We lost him. Um, but anyway, he uh, would appear there, and um, it was just almost like he was talking to those patients in the room with them uh, without the video. Because if you do it right, the technology tends to disappear and uh, definitely can you know make um, make an appointment just as good as it was if the patient was in the same room as the physician. Here are some Bluetooth, some equipment. Some of it can be Bluetooth. Some of it can be um, you know placed in a um, UB, USB port, that type of thing. But these are the types of things that. Um, we're seeing for peripherals, uh, very popular uh, electronic stethoscope so that the physician can hear and even see the heart sounds on his monitor. The exam cam, which can pop off and, and become an otoscope or that type of thing. Um, there are just a lot of different cameras out there that are really good uh, for telemedicine. And then the uh, video otoscope as shown here and it shows that it's almost like, okay, that person's in their home using an otoscope. Okay, yes, uh, you can buy this at-home device in uh, Best Buy for less than $200 and have what a physician may need in order to make a, a really good house call on televideo. Um, it's not going to be too far off that uh, we're going to see most of that in most of the homes um, from now on. Make sure that your provider site doesn't look like this, okay? Um, it needs to have a professional air about it if you're going to have a provider sit in front of a televideo screen. So a great place is their office. Just make sure that, you know, the space behind them is not cluttered. It's best practice to have your logo behind your physician if you're doing that so that uh, the patient knows that 
that's where they're coming from and um, it just gives a little more marketing to your program as well. So step four, you make a plan, a detailed program implementation plan. You're going to need protocols. You're going to need guidelines. You're going to need a workflow. Um, you can contact the HTRC to help you with all of these plans. Um, we have templates and you can, you know, at least you can have a starting point and you don't have to recreate the wheel and please don't because you don't need to. Um, we have templates that can help you uh, get this thing started so that you have, um, you know, it in writing, protocols in writing and good workflow. Uh, so please use your Heartland TRC or use the telehealthresourcecenter.org because we do have those uh, examples and um, uh, workflows, whether it's protocols, whether it's policies, that type of thing. And then step five is the implementation. And that's what we're all in a hurry to do. It's always so fun to implement. Um, but the fact of the matter is it takes a lot to get there. Um, but if you plan quickly and you follow these steps, you're going to be so much ahead of the game. Um, I recommend that you do practice um, before you have that first patient and uh, that you utilize the staff who's going to be, you know, using that equipment and make sure that they're trained um, and that you practice connecting with someone. And if it's, you know, you're connecting from your patients from home, you know, have somebody stay at home and connect with them and make sure that you have in your plan and your workflow how to help them if they need help uh, navigating whatever system it is that you're using. So a lot of people say, okay, is uh, telemedicine going to go away? No, telemedicine's not going to go away after COVID. Uh, some people wish that it would because it's been <laughs> sometimes you know, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks, right? Um, and it, that you don't have to be an old dog, you can just be a stubborn dog. Um, the fact of the matter is that telehealth is, is here to stay because it is convenient. It's a great way for patients. It's more consumer demand than it is provider demand, okay? And so in order to please those patients and to keep those patients, we have to get up to speed on it. Um, in the Heartland, you probably have heard about Mercy Virtual. They've been doing virtual health care for a few years now, just outside of St. Louis and Chesterfield. And this building was built for doctors and nurses to go into this building every day and see patients via telemedicine. All right. So remote patient monitoring, what have you. So they are a little ahead of their time um, and have seen the benefits from it because they have really decreased emergency room visits. They have decreased um, a lot of um, uh, 30 day readmits and saved their health center uh, millions of dollars by doing that. So the lessons learned is still medicine. This technology is just a tool. Equipment doesn't need to be expensive. We talked about that. We talked about planning and practicing, learning from others, and remember that telemedicine implementation is a process, okay? It's not a destination. It's something that you're going to review over and over again to make sure that you're doing a good job. So make sure that you know um, that it is, you know, something that we have to keep up with uh, from now on. Maybe someday we'll call it medicine instead of telemedicine because that's exactly what it is. I just want to remind you that we uh, will again have our telemedicine echo um, on the fourth Tuesday. We're looking at um, a, a St. Louis organization who ramped up and did telemedicine quickly. So it should be a really good um, echo next time. Uh, we have a webinar series as well that you can join. So mark September 8th at noon on your calendar. Uh, we're going to talk about back to school and telehealth. And then also the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers has a webinar. So there is just, you know, a webinar about every week, right? Um, this one is going to talk about using telehealth in the home. So I think it's going to be really good. August 20th, um, go to telehealthresourcecenters.org to register. And then with that, we will go ahead and open it up to questions and see if we can help you start a telemedicine program if you haven't already.
Janine, All right, Lauren, do we have questions? There's a question in the chat from Jerry, and he said, just to follow up slash clarify um, with bandwidth, if I'm in an area where only internet option is satellite and it's rated at 25 Mbps, should I be able to televisit with Zoom and or other via this method? You should be able to, yes. You should be able to. Um, and like I said, you may have to find the hot spots in your building that you're in, okay? And you can do that. There's a way to do that if you ask your internet provider, you know, what it is that you need to download in order to walk around and get the hot spot. So that's something, I mean, you know, that's something to consider. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Or it doesn't have to be about this presentation. It could be something that's come up that you want to talk about that you have had some uh, experience with or you're needing some help with. And you have all of these experts here to help you answer those questions. Don't be shy. This is Callie Ballinger. Um, I've ran into this several times where um, patients come to the clinic, um, but they have COVID symptoms and so their appointment is canceled. Um, and so we really don't have any video capabilities or anything. It's truly just by phone. And I struggle with how to do um, physical assessments over the phone. Is there any recommendations on doing physical assessments just via telephone? Um, that is a really good question. And this, um, the slide that I had uh, that talked about the annual wellness visit, um, I do know that the AMA has a toolkit for COVID. And, and they have some of that information in there for those telephonic calls. If you have trouble finding that, you just let me know, Callie, and I'll have, be happy to, to get that for you. But that is, that is an excellent question. And I know that a lot of times, um, well, they've allowed the telephone because of broadband issues throughout rural America. Um, but we have to always be prepared that if one of our televideo visits drops, that we can pick up the telephone and you can actually finish that appointment and still get reimbursed for it, okay? So it's, um, so it's important to know that as well. Um, yeah, you, you know, you can't do everything by telemedicine and you certainly can't do everything by telephone, but there, you know, there are some recommendations and best practices for that. And, and, you know, we're all learning as we go. We're building the bridge as we're crossing it right now, okay? <laughs> and so we're all, we're all in the same boat. Any other questions? I mean, there's a question in the chat from Heidi and it says, can you comment on how to work as a team with staff rooming so the entire visit and establishing connectivity doesn't fall on the provider alone? Oh, man. That is really, that is a really good question. Um, does anyone have experience with that, that they could share with Heidi how that might happen? Because, you know, I, I'm not a provider, so I do not do this, but if you are a provider or you have staff that is helping rooming these patients so that everything doesn't fall, um, do you have recommendations? I might comment. Um, it, um, we use the multi point function of Zoom so that folks are able to room our patients and then the provider connects as the patient's been roomed. I think what, one thing that was a lesson learned was just making sure we're providing training up front to our roomers um, and doing some, you know, practice rooming and um, also as a provider, um, still having our huddles like we did in um, the on-site setting, but doing that virtually as well. So that kind of each day we're kind of closing the loop about what worked, what didn't work, how can we do it better the next day? Thank you, Evelyn. 
I think they're crucial. So thanks for that question. They've really made the difference in um, patients coming back and sh show rates. So uh, again, great question. Thank you. Absolutely. And we want to make this as seamless as possible so that um, the technology does disappear once the patient is working with that provider. Uh, it's just, you know, it, and it happens. I've seen it. I've seen a physician actually take their stethoscope around their neck and put it up and, and think, oh, they're not here. I can't do that. So that technology does tend to kind of fall away and you start realizing that you're doing this one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with a patient and it's, you know, it's like, it's like you're in the same room. Any other questions in the chat, Lauren? I don't see any, but Janine, I was just going to make a comment on that as a patient perspective. Um, when I had a telehealth visit, I logged on and there was someone on besides the doctor. And I, I was like, oh, shoot, I've logged into the wrong Zoom meeting. So I think it might be beneficial to inform the patient that, you know, the nurse is going to be logging on first before the doctor, because I just thought I completely logged into the wrong Zoom session and had to relook at my Zoom link. I can understand how that that would scare some people, definitely. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is we have to have our patients kind of getting used to this process as well because it is gonna be um, a, a little bit different or the expectations, like Lauren's expectations were different than what um, the medical team were, was thinking probably. So definitely um, those kinds of things are, the the types of uh, training and the steps that you go through in order to make that uh, appointment, uh, a, an excellent appointment cannot be underestimated. You really do need to have a plan and make sure that you're following that every time. So um, there is, um, there's, there are some patient teaching um, sheets that could be sent out to patients prior to a televideo. Um, we're working on one for the HTRC. Um, there are some other ones that are available from like AARP and that type of thing. Um, I know that we have a school, um, Telehealth Rock Schools one that gives those pointers to patients prior to their visit by telehealth. And some of those things are, make sure you're not your TV's not on when you're, you know, these types of appointments from home are so different for people that they kind of forget that you shouldn't have the TV on. It should be in a room that's quiet and private that, you know, people aren't banging doors and coming in and out of your appointment room. Um, and it also gives pointers on, you know, the settings on your phone, your iPad, that type of thing that would help uh, with that appointment. So, um, we're, we hope to have that document um, by the end of the month, actually. Uh, so if you're wanting something like that, you can always take that and then make it your own. That's what we're here for. Hi, this is, this is Shelly Cooper here in Kansas City. I have a quick uh, comment and question. Um, when I work with um, pediatricians and they're performing their telehealth visits, a lot of times I'm getting some concerns of, from parents that they're concerned that their children are being videotaped and those tapes are being held somewhere in a cloud. And so I wonder if there's um, literature that you could provide as an inbox or where I could distribute that to some of my clients and let them know that their children are not being videotaped and give them the basics on the protocols for a telehealth visit in terms of confidentiality, HIPAA, and that type of thing. That is a really good point. Um, Evelyn, do you know how the PED department handles that in, at KU Med? Um, I, again, great question, Shelley. Um, and I know we have families ask as well. I think one thing we do is in our consent, um, we, we specifically address that things are not videotaped, um, but then having a provider also reinforce that um, and kind of asking uh, 
even if the parent isn't asking, you know, the provider going ahead and reinforcing, just want to reassure you that um, th these we're not taping. Um, and, and, you know, also, I think it speaks to asking the patient um, and the uh, parent questions about, you know, what, what's on your mind about telehealth and, you know, trying to get that, that feedback so you can reassure. Thank you. Yes, and you know, reimbursement is for live interactive video that's not being recorded. So we, we do have some language with that, Shelly, that we can put in box, definitely, that you could probably include in a consent or, you know, a, a separate document. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? One other question that I just thought of, this is Callie Ballinger from Missouri. Um, how do you explain to the patient, you know, after you've done a televisit um, and they need to come to the clinic for something, especially like pediatric vaccines or something, um, or I guess maybe that's not a good example because that would be a nurse visit, but um, how do you explain to them that it's, they still have to come to the office and they're going to be pay, um, billed for two visits? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Anyone have experience with that? You know, I think, um, like we said, during this time of pandemic, that we're experiencing a lot of new things and we're having to do things a little bit differently uh, when it comes to our healthcare. And so, um, yes, they would be billed for a telemedicine vi visit, you know, but if they have another in-person visit coming up, that that will also be billed. I don't think you can really get around that um, unless there's, you know, some kind of protocol that you're um, introducing them to telehealth and you're going to eat that. And I don't think anybody wants to do that because that's provider time. But sometimes you have to do the right thing for your patients. Um, definitely, you know, they do have to come in and get their vaccines. They do have to come in, you know, for certain um, physical exams uh, and that type of thing. And so it's just the fact of the matter, you know, um, that you may have to explain that up front, perhaps in consent forms as well, that there may be times that there are visits that are appropriate for telehealth and then there are visits that are appropriate for in-person. Um, and just don't take advantage, you know, of the patient uh, by doing unnecessary um, telehealth visits. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Good question. All right. Well, I tell you what. Um, Dean, I think yeah. there was um, something came up in the chat um, from Melissa Martin, and it okay. says DocsyMe is a free software that has an automatic waiting room. It's a HIPAA, it's HIPAA secured, and it works by sending a link to the patient, which they click and enter a waiting room. Um, and then the MD or nurse practitioner then chooses which patient to video visit with when she is ready. Ah, very good. Yes, DoxyMe has been very popular with a lot of organizations, um, definitely. And they, they may have been offering some, uh, I don't know, maybe they stopped after a couple of months, but I know that they were on that list at one time for free and reduced costs. But you can always, you know, talk to the salesman and convince them that you need something for low cost. <laughs> Excellent. All right. You know, Zoom fatigue is real, and I know that we have more than one meeting today uh, for a lot of us, so I'm going to give you a little bit of your time back and make sure that um, you put on your calendar that we have our next session in two weeks, two weeks from today. So 
Um, we'll get that, um, the speaker information out to you as soon as we find that out. So thank you so much for joining us today and go out and make it a great day. Goodbye.